Hi, good evening. I'm Lonnie Stonich, the executive director of FAN. We're a nonprofit that presents programming exploring human development across the lifespan. I'm honored to welcome you to tonight's conversation between Dr. Lisa Mosconi and Dr. Lisa Genova. Thanks for joining us tonight. Our YouTube channel has an archive of over 300 videos of past events, so be sure to subscribe to the channel to get updates when new recordings are posted. And now for some introductions. Dr. Lisa Mosconi is an Associate Professor of Neuroscience in Neurology and Radiology at Weill Cornell Medicine and the Director of the Alzheimer's Prevention Program at Weill Cornell Medicine, New York Presbyterian Hospital. The program includes the Women's Brain Initiative, the Alzheimer's Prevention Clinic, and the Alzheimer's Prevention Clinical Trials Unit. Dr. Mosconi is the author of the New York Times bestselling The XX Brain and of the international bestseller Brain Food, which have been translated into more than 15 languages. Her TED Talk, How Menopause Affects the Brain, has been viewed over 2 million times in the first three months since its release. Joining her is Dr. Lisa Genova, who graduated valedictorian summa cum laude from Bates College with a degree in biopsychology, and she has a PhD in neuroscience from Harvard. She has captured a special place in contemporary fiction, writing stories that are equally inspired by neuroscience and the human spirit. She is the New York Times bestselling author of the novels Still Alice, Left Neglected, Love Anthony, Inside the O'Briens, and Every Note Played. Still Alice was adapted into a film, and Julianne Moore won the 2015 Best Actress Oscar for her role as Alice Howland. Film adaptations for other books are also in development. Dr. Genova's first work of nonfiction, Remember, The Science of Memory and the Art of Forgetting, I love that, published in March of 2021, was an instant New York Times bestseller. Wow, what a night. Let's welcome doctors Lisa Moscone and Lisa Genova. Oh, thank you, Lonnie. Hello, Lisa. Hi, how are you? I'm good, my dear friend. How are you? I am good. I'm so happy to see you. Thank you so much for doing this. And they're just, I'm just so happy that we get a chance to connect. <laughs> I know, I know. I am too. And it's been so fun. I, I got to, as you know, I got to read your book early. And so I've been yes. so excited about it for so many months leading up to its release. And it's so wonderful to see its reception. And I, we were talking offline before we started about how this really does feel like a moment in time where women of a certain age, and I'm 53, so I'm right in this, um, we're ready to talk about this, but we didn't have the vehicle or the, the language or enough understanding of what the heck it is we're going through because the generation before us didn't talk to us about it. So your book has landed, I feel, at the absolute right time for to be the vehicle for us to have the conversation about what is going on with us. Um, so it's, it's wonderfully exciting. Um, let's start with just talking about, it. there's so much confusion around all of this, including even what is menopause? Like how, when is it, what is it? Like, how do we define like the language we're using matters? So what is menopause and, and then what does it have to do with the brain? Cause most people don't think that it has anything to do with their brain. They just assume it's, you know, the lady parts. Yes, <laughs> the lady finds yeah, that's true. You know, it's such an interesting question because it's such a difficult question to actually answer. So there, there are basically two answers. There's a standard medical textbook driven answer, which I'm not too fond of. And then there's a more integrative answer that includes our brains, where we really look at a woman as an organism and as an organism that's in change. So I'll start with a traditional answer, which is that menopause marks the end of a woman's reproductive life and is retroactively diagnosed as having 12 months without the menstrual cycle. So if we look at menopause from the ovaries perspective, what happens for us as women is that we do have a reproductive cycle starting at puberty and that at some point, the length and frequency of our menstrual cycle will change with the cycle becoming more irregular. Mm -hmm. And that marks the beginning of the menopause transition or perimenopause, which is an in-between of having a menstrual cycle and then no longer having a menstrual cycle. Then at some point, your menstrual cycle just stops. And 12 months later, a year later, you can finally declare that <laughs> you are effectively 
in menopause. And at that point, most women are about 51, 52, maybe 53 years old. And the entire rest of a woman's life will be spent in a postmenopausal stage. Now, if you actually look at menopause as not just something that impacts the ovaries, but something that impacts an entire woman's body and brain, then things look a little bit different. And I will, I will start by saying that when women say that they're having hot flashes and nice sweats, insomnia, mm -hmm. depression, anxiety, brain fog, my expertise and memory lapses, those are in fact symptoms of menopause. However, they have nothing to do with the ovaries. Right. Right. Those are brain generated symptoms. Those are neurological symptoms that come from the ways the menopause changes the brain. So if we look at menopause this way, then we have a slightly different situation where the changes actually begin in the brain at least before the menstrual cycle starts changing. And they keep occurring, the transition is still active for a few years after the final menstrual period. And that's why so many women who are postmenopausal still have the symptoms. There are women who have hot flashes for a decade after the final menstrual period. And that's because the brain is still in transition. So yeah. it's much more complicated. Yes. But I love for folks who haven't read Lisa's book yet, and I encourage all of you to, um, one of the things I love about it is that it feels very conversational. You're taking something that is, you know, we're talking about the brain and how the brain changes as you go through these years leading up to menopause and, and to postmenopause. Um, and that might sound like it could be intimidating, like, oh, this is a book yes. about the brain. Like, is this, you know, too neuroscientific? But no, Lisa does a beautiful job of, of it really feels like a conversation with a friend who happens to be a neuroscientist. Mm -hmm. And the explanations are so satisfying because there's like, let's talk about the symptoms, right? That begin, you know, as the changes in your brain begin and you start to go um, into perimenopause or the menopause transition, um, what are what are some of the symptoms and and how are they brain related? Mm. It makes so much sense when you look at this from a neuroscientific perspective, and it's so helpful to understand what's going on with you rather than thinking like, "Am I making this up? Am I going crazy? Um, I'm, you know, I'm still getting my period, so why am I experiencing all of this?" So, yeah, explain to us how. What are some of the symptoms and how are they brain related? Mm. So, I think that menopause comes with a variety of symptoms in the range that is not really fully formalized in medicine and is certainly not something that most women are aware of. So I think it's important to clarify that some symptoms of menopause are somatic symptoms or bodily symptoms or physical symptoms from the neck down or at least from the brain out, right? And then there's a long list of symptoms that are actually brain-driven and are neurological or, and or psychiatric in nature. And the bodily symptoms are, some are well known, some not quite. So there are changes in metabolic activity. There are changes in bone density. There are changes in skin tone, for example. Now the brain symptoms are the symptoms that most women actually have trouble with, that impact your can impact your quality of life can be quite disruptive and the most important ones are grouped into cores or clusters of symptoms so we have vasomotor symptoms like hot flashes and night sweats which are hot flashes happening at night but somehow we felt the need to call them something different like night sweats and then we have uh, sleep disturbances in part because of the night sweats, but some yeah. women just have trouble falling asleep. Some women have trouble staying asleep. Some women have trouble with both. Some yeah. women actually develop insomnia. There's So there's really a range of severity and frequency within each one of these scores. There's yeah. mood. And, and Lisa, that I would imagine that perpetuates a, a positive feedback loop where if you're getting less sleep, then you're probably more likely to experience more hot flashes. 
I don't know. Is that true? Possibly. Well, there's certainly a connection because taking hormones for hot flashes helps Yeah. improve sleep and that reduces stress. And that Yeah. seems to have a positive impact of hot flashes. Hormones work, you know, it's, it's in symph it's really a symphony of different hormones that are involved in different functionality. So if you're able to alleviate one symptom, there's a good chance that some of the other symptoms will also get better. There certainly is no ball effect, which is good. It's good to know because Yeah. Right. Right. symptoms And so, are yeah, easier all to that test. lack of sleep is, is, is snowballing into a, a negative direction. So it could feed into more depression, more brain fog, more Right. night sweats. Yeah. So anything Yeah. that's disrupting your sleep is like a, is something to address because you Yes. don't want that to happen. Right. 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 Yes. <laughs> and we all had trouble sleeping to start with, right? So we Yeah. know that according to the National Sleep Foundation, that women have a harder time sleeping than men at any age, but especially in midlife and during the transition to menopause. So during perimenopause is really when sleep disturbances tend to become more of an issue, but sometimes persist well into the postmenopausal stage. So that's something to certainly to address. And then there's mood, which is also really a concern where some women have some mild depressive symptoms, some women have more depressive symptoms, some, some women are suicidal. So there's also something to consider. And then there's my specialty core, which is cognition and yours Mm -hmm. as well, where so many women suffer, I would say legit suffering for Yeah. brain fog Yeah. and forgetfulness and memory lapses that for some women... can be mild, but for others are severe enough to really prompt concerns about early onset dementia. Right. And that that's that's effectively scary. And you know, that It's alarming. Yeah. is sixty percent of all women who are perimenopausal and postmenopausal report brain fog at least once a day. And that that is a problem because we're talking about millions of women who are in the primal in their primal life. really feel like the rug has been pulled from out of them. Right. They have no idea what hit them. I think that's what I was trying to do with the book was really to take the fear and the mystery out of menopause and say, okay, this is why you have these symptoms. This is how your brain changes that gives you the symptoms. It's not Right. the aliens are hijacking your brain. And the vast majority of the time is not early onset dementia. It's actually just... menopause and these are all the ways that we can diagnose that and then these are all the ways that we can make it better and then the final core is low libido which may seem like yeah well it's not such a big deal but for so many women really is a problem with their relationships Right. and their self-esteem as well and maybe you know it could be one reason that the majority of divorces also take place in midlife if you think about it So these are Yeah. the core, these are the Okay. core symptoms. That's a lot, right? Yeah, It no, really it's a lot. does Also, give you. you know, I summarize them into five, but it really trickles down. And also there's all the pure neurological symptoms like headaches and dizziness and vertigos and skin crawling sensation. When you feel like there's some bug crawling under your skin or electric shock sensations and tinnitus and burning tongue and dry mouth. I hesitate to say I haven't had that. I don't want to be stricken down. <laughs> um, yeah, I have friends who've mentioned those. Yeah, I get before I get a hot flash, I, I get almost a, a, a wave of of heart palpitation and, and panic. And I have nothing to be panicked about in that moment. I, it's it's hard not to succumb to that overwhelm. Um, Yes. and it helps to know what it is like, oh, this Yes. is. this is part of my menopause transition. Like I'm okay. I just breathe and I will get through to the other side of it. Yeah. But it, it's alarming when you don't know what, what's causing all of these things. And it's like you said, there's a menu of symptoms. There's, there's such a spectrum um, of what might be happening to you versus me versus another woman. And we're all maybe in the same phase, but we're all experiencing different manifestations. Yes, and the problem, one problem, I think, is that medical professionals are trained to recognize hot flashes as a symptom of menopause, but that's it pretty much, right? The vast majority of doctors legitimately would have a hard time 
associating brain fog with menopause because the education is in there. Yeah, well, the you were, when they there. were in medical school, you you hadn't done your research yet. So this research right, is Right, that's too. also, yeah, <laughs> right. that's true too. There's also a timeline component for sure. Yeah. It's also something else that I find alarming and I'm sure you'll sympathize is, so menopause has been historically pigeonholed as an issue with the ovaries. Yes. And it's been confined in many ways to the OB-GYN, OBGYN territory. Mm -hmm. That's a problem for two reasons. Reason number one is that one, only one in five OB-GYN residents receives any training in menopause at all, right? So one in five is 20%. What are the odds that you go to specialists for menopause right. and they might actually be ready to help you they, they're low 20 percent is not great no it is not and the other problem is that even the best menopause specialists do not receive any training in neurology or psychiatry or psychology or otherwise brain specialties and then you go to a brain specialist and of course they're not trained to manage right. menopause and that that's a big problem with the Western medical model yeah. for women's health because it's all ovaries. It's all ovaries, breasts, and babies. Right. But Lady menopause, parts, right. Yeah. yeah. It, needs, it needs to be an interdisciplinary approach, and it's not. No, um, it's certainly not. We are trying to do that now at the clinic. So like Lonnie mentioned, I run the Alzheimer's Prevention Program that has an Alzheimer's Prevention Clinic. Yep. And because we see so many women who are going through menopause and they're coming to us for Alzheimer's prevention, but in reality, they're, they're going through menopause. Yeah. And so we're really trying to develop a framework where in neurology, we are able to diagnose and treat brain issues in menopause. And let me tell you, there's no CPT codes to do that. We can't even... Uh -huh. bill insurance because we're not supposed to be doing that wow. so the whole framework needs to be rearranged and there's ways to do them we're working on that and we work with the ob department as well to make sure that we triage okay. in a way and we also yeah. work with cardiol preventative cardiologists and endocrinologists and metabolic specialists and the stroke unit and blah blah, blah. And we really try to, to address every single aspect of our patient's brain health. But it's been more of a hassle than I thought it would be. Yeah. It's a headache. Yeah, welcome <laughs> to, to the U.S. healthcare. <laughs> any, um, any healthcare. Yeah. There's really no framework. No, this is truly, um, you're like in the Wild West here. Like this is unclaimed, unchartered territory that you're in. And we're so grateful that you're out there doing this. Mm -hmm. um, because yeah, the, these conversations, this information, you know, didn't exist when mm -hmm. people our age were in medical school. So like, this is new territory. You know, it's something really interesting um, to just to piggyback on what you were saying that estrogen as a hormone was yeah. discovered in the 1930s, okay. right? And then it was it was discovered by scientists who were studying reproduction, reproductive function and fertility. And so immediately they labeled estrogen, testosterone, progesterone as sex hormones. Right. And we've been stuck with that definition ever since. And then what happened is that in 1992, um, Dr. McEwen, Bruce McEwen yeah. at Rockefeller University, right, they discovered that the same hormones that are so important for fertility and reproduction are just as important for brain function. Yeah. And that was, in, in fact, it was acknowledged widely in 1996. Now, for, for context, men landed on the moon <laughs> 30 years uh -huh. prior. I, I mean, we know more about space. That we know. know about women's brains. About women's I brains. Find it so incredible. And all women go through menopause. Right. All women go through menopause and nobody yeah. cares. I know. And I think it's incredible. And so, like, ladies out there, like, just know that, like, yes. in your brain from adolescence, so through puberty, Lisa talks about the three Ps for those of you who've mm -hmm. had babies through puberty, through pregnancy, then perimenopause. Um, you know, we have estrogen receptors in our brains. Um, and Estrogen is 
is interacting with our brains throughout our lives. Um, so it isn't just um, a hormone that has to do with sexual reproduction or your 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 uh, menstrual cycle. It is interacting with your brain throughout your life. And that I think most people don't know. No, I don't think most people realize that there is such a thing as an estrogen receptor. Okay. I, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for you, is that well, obvious? Wait, no, one ta- no one's talked about it. So this year, again, your Nobody's book is talking. like, so it's so eye-opening for so it's going to be just such a, um, a revelation and such a help to so many millions of women. And it's share it with your girlfriends. Um, it's, it's to, it's a vehicle for conversation for sure. Um, I hope so. I really hope so. That was my intention to, yeah. to that was really, it. you I can think, feel, yeah, yeah. And you can feel the love you have for women in, in that book. This is a very, um, a very pro woman book. Like it's, there's so much love and respect for women in this book, which I really, really felt and appreciated. Um, let's talk about hormone replacement therapy, because I think that is an area of massive confusion and concern and misinformation. So what Mm -hmm. do we know about hormone, um, replacement therapy today? Um, and, and, and how is that different from maybe the, the myths and concerns that we grew up with? You know, it really goes back to the estrogen receptor situation that we were talking about. So Hormones are really, really important, but hormones alone, like estrogen alone, does not matter. What matters most is the way that the hormones interact with their specific receptors. So just to clarify, I think this is really important. I'm trying to to explain it because that really clarifies a lot also about hormone replacement therapy. So our brains as women are born with estrogen receptors, which is these little components, these little units. They're constantly looking for estrogen. Once you have estrogen in your bloodstream, it goes up inside your brain, finds the receptors, it binds to the receptors. And it's like a key opening a lock, turning on a lock. And then the door opens, the receptor door opens and a huge amount of things happen inside your brain, which are usually very positive. So the binding of estrogen with the receptors triggers brain energy, right? It's a booster for brain energy, promotes neuroplasticity, and improves trophic factors. So it makes your brain, your brain cells grow or develop or remain supple and plastic, which is what you want for resilience. Improves also improves blood flow to the brain. It improves immunity inside your brain. So it's overall like an anti-aging effect in some ways, right? It keeps your brain really healthy and happy and energized. Now, if the receptor isn't there, you can try and put the hormones inside the brain, but nothing will happen. Mm -hmm. So what we know now about hormone um, replacement therapy is that you need to have both. You need to have the hormones and you need to have receptors that want the hormones. And these receptors in the brain are especially active during perimenopause and then for a certain amount of time after the last final menstrual period. If you wait too long, the estrogen will be gone, but the receptors will be gone too. So you can't just put the hormones back in because the hormones have nowhere to go. That's what happened with the Women's Health Initiative, which is this study that started in 1993 before people discovered that estrogen was important for brain health, right? But this huge clinical trial started testing hormone replacement therapy for heart flashes, but also for prevention of cardiovascular disease and dementia. Mm -hmm. And because it's a clinical trial, you only have a certain amount of time to run the study, you can't do it forever. Right. And dementia happens in all, the, the diagnosis of dementia is usually in the 70s and 80s and the highest numbers of heart attacks and whatnot are also in old age. So they started the trial by looking at women who were in the 70s and 80s, mm-hmm. which makes sense statistically, but is not the right way to test hormone therapy for anything because it's too late. The system right. is not there anymore. Right. Sure All of enough, those estrogen receptors have been downregulated. They're not there mm-hmm. anymore. Yeah. And the same in the body. Yep. You can't just turn them back on when you want. 
It's a system that needs to be supported. Right. And so what happened is that the outcomes were negative. They reported more heart attacks, more strokes, more blood clotting disorders, more dementia. And now we know that the reason for that is that they just started too late. Whereas if you work with women who are going through menopause, women who are in midlife, and within 10 years of the final menstrual period, hormone replacement therapy can alleviate hot flashes and may possibly also reduce the risk of heart attack and heart disease and dementia, which is under investigation. Right Now, what we know, the major reason that women don't really explore hormone therapy as an option is breast cancer. Is the right. fear breast I was just going to get to that. That's the biggest fear, people. They talk about worrying about cardiovascular disease and breast cancer as like, oh, I can't go on hormone replacement therapy because that's too risky. I don't want to risk bre getting breast cancer. So what do we yeah. know? Well, that's what happened in the Women's Health Initiative. They right. had two separate arms. They had one group of women with the uterus. Yep. And if you have a uterus, you typically you take estrogen and the progesterone together with a placebo control group. And then they had a group of women who did not have a uterus, they had a hysterectomy. And therefore they were only taking estrogen without the progesterone. And it's not progesterone in that case, it was a synthetic progestin called MPA, which has now been discontinued. But this is what they were working with back then in very high doses of a special type of estrogen. And what they found in the group of women with the uterus is that the number of breast cancers was actually higher in the treated group as compared to placebo by like 22%, which somehow reached significance. In the other group, there was a reduction in the risk of breast cancer that nobody ever talked about. And the media just- You say the other group, this was the group without a uterus? The group without a uterus who was okay. taking only estrogen. They yeah. actually had a, a lower risk of yeah. developing breast cancer during yeah. the duration of the study. But the media really zoned in on the breast cancer risk in the other trial. And that turned into a gigantic catastrophe where now you had this black warning label on HRT. You know, when you buy the little package, there's the black warning saying this may increase your risk of breast cancer, even though there may be bioidentical estradiol in there. It could be a transdermal option that was not associated with an increased risk of breast cancer. So I think what's important is to realize two things. Number one, we're working with different hormones now. Mm -hmm. We're doing lower doses, transdermal, which is gentler. It doesn't go through the liver. So it does not really increase the risk of blood clots the way that other formulations did. Okay. The risk is never zero. Prescription medicines always come with warnings and yeah. risks, but the risk was definitely overinflated. And now, so that's the first thing. We're, we're looking at different hormones. And number two, we're using them at the right time. And what professional societies say, which, you know, you always want to follow professional societies because they're so conservative and so strict and they really check everything. And what they say is that for healthy, otherwise, you know, generally healthy women without a prior history, personal history of breast cancer, who are let's say up to age 60 or at least within 10 years of the final menstrual period, taking hormone replacement therapy, whether estrogen alone or estrogen and the progesterone is generally safe. The benefits outweigh the risks yep. and it's a safe option for most women. The, the risk of breast cancer is rare. That's what they, is the word that they use. It's a rare occurrence. Yes. So I think not. this is is reassuring. Also, it's, it's helpful, I think, to put it in context. So the risk of breast cancer is actually lower with HRT than it is uh, with drinking two glasses of wine a day. Oh, that's important. It's half the risk. And we're talking about a very low risk to start with. It's even lower than leading a sedentary life. Mm -hmm. And it's six times lower than having high breast density. Okay. It's lower okay. than being a flight attendant. Okay. You know, I just want to put it. Yeah, no, that's in. helpful because people have been scared by that women's health initiative study and it, the media grabbed hold of, of the misinformation and ran with it. And I think that that, that has led to a sense of distrust and yes. uncertainty as to like, well, is it safe or not? Like I, 
you know, and it's, you don't want to trade, you don't want to trade um, alleviating some discomfort and, and some unsettling symptoms for breast cancer. Like, so, no, so women have been hesitant and it's so helpful to know the truth so we can make the informed decision and not have to suffer through hot flashes and insomnia and depression and frozen shoulder and osteoporosis or whatever is going on, <laughs> crawling, skin crawling sensations, um, because we think that if we give ourselves a chance at this medication, that we're going to be doomed to breast cancer. Yeah. So. But I think what's important is to, to be aware of what the reality is. Right. And then have an open conversation with your, your doctor based on your own personal history, family history, your own individual risk tolerance. And I, I want to be very, very clear that I, I think HRT is a viable option for many women, but it's not like if you don't use HRT, you're doomed, right? So I'm not pushing or HRT. Not, no, like this is like if you are ever. having symptoms that are interfering with your ability to function and your quality of life, that we as women do not have to just put your head down and suffer through and get yes. through the next 10 to 20 years, right? <laughs> um, it's like 10 years leading up to it, maybe in 10 years post, um, that there are options that, that yes. hormone yes. replacement therapy is a, um, a safe option. Yeah, for um, most women. And yeah. it's, it's really important to me personally that whatever decision one makes, is based on information and not on fear. Because I've heard so many women say, I did not take hormones because I was scared of breast cancer. And now finally the guidelines have changed. Yes. And professional societies are saying, well, actually the risk of breast cancer is super low. But okay. up until 2022, the guidelines were really quite cautionary. They were like, do not take hormones unless you really can't do without. This is very is recent, not... Lisa. So how many yes. of the OBGYNs out there do you think know this new information? So you're telling, you know, women, okay, go to your doctor and have a conversation. Are the doctors out there up to, to date with? Uh, you know, real? they should be. Doctors who are trained in menopause care should be because these guidelines are available everywhere. They were posted very, very publicly because it was a little bit of an apology as so well. That's reassuring. Yes, yes. Yes. Okay. But you need to be up to speed with changes in guidelines and regulations. And there's a chance that if you were told as a physician for many, many years or 20 years that your patients might be better off without hormones, right. then it is a little bit strange to all of a sudden. Yes. So, well, actually, right. And so now it's okay. Is, so right. I think it takes a minute also for a provider to really True. feel safe. This, if this is the right thing to do. But I, I think, yes. I think there's enough evidence that that really speaks to the benefits of hormone therapy and um, how yeah. valuable while you still have those is. estrogen receptors. Is yes. there, <laughs> yes. Are there, is, there's a new, um, there's estrogen receptor specific therapy in development. Yes. Yes. Thank you for asking. So <laughs> the, the hormones we're working with clinically right now are the second generation of hormones. What we're working on now, what scientists are trying to develop is the third generation, which is estrogen receptor specific, but also organ specific which I think is fantastic. And we are now doing a clinical trial, the Wild Cornet Medicine. It's, it's an NIH-sponsored, phase 2B, placebo-controlled, randomized, double-blind clinical trial, which means a very thorough clinical yes. trial of a kind. really, yeah. So it's a really interesting type of estrogen that's called the SERM, a selective estrogen receptor modulator, S-E-R-M, that was specifically developed by my colleague, Dr. Brinton, Dr. Robbie Brinton at the University of Arizona. And it's a neuroserm. So it's a serm for the brain, which means that once you take it, it's like a little pill, you just take it by mouth and the estrogen dissolves and then enters the bloodstream and goes straight up into your brain mm -hmm. and binds specifically to estrogen receptor beta, mm -hmm. which is present in brain, but not so much of reproductive tissues. And so the overall effect is that this CERM supports brain health and brain function, 
but has either inhibitory or neutral effects on reproductive tissue. What does it mean? It does not increase the risk of breast cancer or uterine cancer, and you don't need to take a progesterone just, with it. Yeah. So it's just an estrogen. And actually, it's technically a supplement that like pharmaceutically is a nutraceutical oh, that's been tested. We're testing it with the FDA with the same vigor as a prescription medication. Yeah. So we get all the headaches, but the overall outcome is that it's going to be tested really, really thoroughly, and then hopefully will be available over the counter at some point. Okay. So wow. we're very excited about that. Would that would be amazing. That would be amazing. And then also to not need the the progesterone as well. And so women out there, you know that you need to take the progesterone along with the estrogen so that you don't increase your risk of endometrial cancer. That's yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah, that's correct. But um, women with the uterus it is recommended to take a progesterone oh. along with the estrogen because estrogen stimulates cellular yes. proliferation. It makes it makes things grow, right? It's actually like a fertilizer in a way. And taking the progesterone with it lowers the risk of over proliferation, over especially in the youth. So this next generation, this third generation of hormone replacement therapy mm -hmm. will be more specific. It's brain specific and it will allow us to be on one less drug therefore reducing any potential side effects and cost as well and cost um, as well so that's, and it that's should exciting. be and we're hoping that we will be available to all women because right now hormone therapy comes with contraindications right so if you have a history or like if you had blood clots in the past your provider won't give it to you if you have a history of heart disease they won't give it to you if your bmi is too high they won't give it to you if you have a personal history of breast cancer, you're just not eligible. So there are a lot of women who are just not in a yeah. position to use hormone therapy right now. And yeah. I think that's why these designer estrogens are so important because they're really, it's a fresh start. Yeah, You're absolutely. developing these compounds to make sure that they work in very specific organs without touching other organs so we really avoid yeah. a lot of concerns so they're elegant, not available I love yet it. i love well, hopefully, it hopefully so. yeah hopefully by the time i go through menopause <laughs> i'll be able to take some of the <laughs> hormones <laughs> that's great um so for women who um aren't uh you know, don't, are advised not to take hormone replacement therapy for the reasons you just mentioned, or who are maybe hesitant for other reasons, or if they want to try lifestyle changes first, yeah. um, what are some of the things that we can do outside of um, pharmaceuticals that can assist us with the symptoms of menopause and, and, our, and what's changing in our brain due to menopause? Mm. So for lifestyle modifications and adjustments, what people typically recommend and so the way for brain health is related to menopause is a combination of diet exercise stress reduction sleep hygiene avoiding toxins intellectual stimulation which is not necessarily because of menopause but to stimulate brain brain health in regular medical checkups those are really important so I would highlight maybe the most important things would be, so for exercise, so for exercise actually is interesting that there's a little bit more research now. Exactly. And what the different studies have shown is that different types of exercise may help with different symptoms of menopause. And again, there isn't like a huge amount of studies done. I know, I was just going to say, ladies, this is, again, we are at the beginning of it all because they only <laughs> ever studied men's brains, men's bodies, men in clinical trials, met like male rats. Every male research rats. study I ever, ever did was all on male mice and male rats. So we are, Lisa's at the forefront of all of this. <laughs> yes. Okay, there's, so, so there's, what, some, uh, there's some research that's been done now and we can say that at least for now, it looks like cardiovascular activity may be especially good for hot flashes and brain fog. Okay. Whereas strength training seems to be helpful for metabolic activity and bone density, bone preservation, but also for mood. Okay. And then flexibility in mind-body techniques like yoga, Pilates, Tai Chi, you know, this gentler kind of 
exercises are helpful for flexibility for sure, but also for stress reduction and sleep. So if one is able to diversify a little bit, mm. that might be really helpful to address all the different symptoms. And then if you're in a pinch, you run. <laughs> Just <laughs> run because that's where you get the most bang for your buck. And that's, it's really, it, it's the shortest way to get an influx of blood flow and nutrients and oxygens and those newly discovered proteins that seem to be really supportive for brain health. You get them really quickly. Okay. from doing some kind of aerobic exercise. Not not too intense necessarily, but just something that stimulates heart rate and brings some color to your cheeks. Okay. And that's a nice definition. And for diet, I will say that the Mediterranean diet, which I know you also appreciate, yep. is the one diet that's been, well, number one is the best researched it diet. It is, yes that is undeniable lots of research everybody this is you know this is not um a one-off this is thousands and thousands of participants over many years um many different countries doing these studies so yes a very well studied menu of foods yeah yes and there is consistent evidence that this kind of diet or at least this diet pattern has a positive effect on women's health overall with lower rates of depression and lower rates of anxiety and the lower risk of breast cancer and the lower risk of cardiovascular disease and certainly a lower risk of dementia as well. And of course, we want more research always, but I think it's, it's the one type of diet that's been most consistently shown to have positive effects. And it's delicious. Tell, pe tell people just really quick, what are some of the ingredients of a Mediterranean menu for people who don't know? Pasta. No. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. We wish, yeah. yeah. Um, well, fresh veggies and fruits. So produce is really, I would say vegetables and fruits are really the star of, of the menu, but also uh, whole grains, legumes, nuts and seeds, um, fruit oils like extra virgin olive oil of course it's it's a very important part of that and then smaller amounts of fish eggs and even smaller amounts of dairy and meat so it's a very flexible diet that also includes occasional treats of course I'm Italian born and raised in, like in Italy. <laughs> um, so I can attest to the fact that eating ice cream is not the norm you know having fruit is the typical dessert is a piece yeah. of fruit or some kind of fruity thing but it's a very flexible diet it's fresh is rich in fiber complex carbohydrates vitamins minerals antioxidants uh and it's delicious it's a really right. yummy yeah diet. and then yeah. of course everybody's is specific about their diets but i think i think you can't go wrong by having antioxidants in your diet no matter the source right yes yeah It'll make a difference. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Because the brain is such a metabolically active organ that is especially delicate and vulnerable to oxidative stress. And so are the ovaries. Okay. Right? This is one thing that really characterizes the brain and the ovaries is that they're, they're the two organs where the majority of cells do not regenerate. Okay. Right? Neurons yeah. are born with us and stay with us yeah. for a lifetime. And so do our follicles. You know, once yeah. you run out, you're out. So it's really important to provide antioxidants to slow down cellular aging, especially in the brain and ovaries, which is why smoking is the number one ovarian toxin, because it really increases free radical production and oxidation, yeah. and it kills your follicles, which has been linked with an earlier or premature onset of menopause for women. So it's really the number one self-inflicted issue when it comes to ovarian health. And also secondhand smoking is just as bad. So I usually, when our patients say, you know, maybe my husband smokes or I smoked for a long time, we always recommend antioxidants. And then if you're exposed to secondhand smoke, then an air purifier is a really good investment. Okay. Right. Um, what about alcohol? Ah. <laughs> I know. They all loved us up until now, Lisa. <laughs> Let's see. We lost our crowd. Yeah. Well, you know what's interesting? I don't drink a drop of alcohol. I never yeah. have. 
Oh, never. Okay. Never. I mean, this is actually funny. When so in Italy, you can you can you grow up drinking wine. Right. It's just you do just a little bit here and there. And I never really liked it. Yeah. But then when I was 18, there's the legal age when you can start drinking in Italy. Sometimes I had a cocktail here and there. And then when I turned 21, I was like, that's it. It's just it's not for me. I don't like it. I don't need it. So when people here can actually start drinking, I was like, I'm done. <laughs> and that was the end of it. But so for women, unfortunately, alcohol has a bad effect when it comes to menopause. For most women, tolerance and sensitivity to alcohol changes yes. along with changes in estrogen and hormonal concentrations. And most women become more sensitive to the side effects or have more side effects from drinking alcohol. And it could make the hot flashes actually worse. And it can also impair sleep or disturb sleep. And also we all know that, I mean, the primary function of alcohol is to be dehydrating is a dehydrating agent. And the the one thing that your brain really does not tolerate is dehydration. Yeah. So yeah, alcohol is, is really bad news for brain health. I know, I, would I know. Say a little bit of red wine here and there can be right. that bad. No. But, but it's, you're not but doing it's, the transition. Right. If you're having, you know, hot flashes and night sweats and you're having trouble sleeping um, and you're drinking wine, at, you know, in the evening before bed, maybe try not drinking the wine, do a little experiment on yourself yeah. and see, because you're like the, the wine can exacerbate the hot flashes. It, yes. can, um, it, it wakes you up, actually. Wake you up, on. And then you have to go pee. Yeah. Um, it, disrupts, <laughs> it disrupts REM sleep. So it really is gonna, if you're already in a state of like sleep is fragile, right? And it, it's yeah. difficult to get that full night's sleep. Um, Alcohol is not your friend. And so, yeah, there's there's been a lot of um misinformation out there about how, how like, oh, red wine is going to help you prevent Alzheimer's and dementia. Yeah. And that's not true. And it's so if you're mm -hmm. experiencing brain fog as well, like that the, the, the drinking isn't going to help either. No. So and look, maybe neither is coffee if we want to be absolutely open. Right? Uh -huh. it's gonna go um I, do you drink coffee I don't drink coffee I am very sensitive to caffeine I, I do drink tea but only before noon yes if it's, after, if it's afternoon I might be up all night <laughs> uh, yes same and I I recently about a year ago I actually switched to decaf because I love coffee and they yeah. have my little professional coffee machine where you actually grind the beans fresh and there's like it a, so good. a yep. thing. and I just could not give up on that I just couldn't do it and so I switched to decaf coffee beans and I didn't tell Kevin I didn't tell my husband <laughs> and he was for a little while I was like oh boy this coffee just doesn't do anything for me I was like oh maybe you drink too much oh. <laughs> and then I said I was like honey it's decaf but Absolutely. because I like the flavor and I like the antioxidants in coffee. Yes. And so yes. I think and decaf so is much, good. So much about that's good for your um, brain health. There's so many studies that's, that show that um, drinking coffee or tea or both are actually very beneficial for um, your brain health today and, and possibly. Two cups a day though. Alzheimer's. Like there's this inverted U yeah. shape. Yeah, yeah. It's only about 30 milligrams of caffeine. Between 30 and 45 milligrams of caffeine, they bring you in the high gain zone. But if you exceed that amount, actually the gains decline. Okay. You're yeah. welcome. Thank you. <laughs> so helpful chatting with you about all these things. So um, what would you say, like what's the biggest heartfelt takeaway that you want your readers to walk away with from with your book like what is what is in your heart that you want people to feel or know after having read your book I would really like two things the first one is for all women to embrace the fact that we are going to go through menopause and that we're all going to spend God willing right we're going to go through menopause and aging really is a gift yeah and most women spend 30 or up to 40% of their lives in a postmenopausal state. So right. we cannot we cannot buy into this narrative that postmenopausal women are, are old, we're not, Done. less attractive, we're not, yeah. less interesting, we're not, less useful, forget it. 
right? Women are amazing at any age in all walks of life. And they think there's something to be really celebrated about menopause in that for so many women, it's a turning point. And it's a little bit of a wake up call. When you, when you, at that point in your life, you've been through so much that you can really positively appreciate the intelligent adaptations that your body and brain make for you and everything that they have done for you over the course of a lifetime and that they will keep doing for you if you treat them nicely and if you take care of them. So I think that self-care becomes even more important starting at this stage, which is when most women really don't have time for themselves. Yeah. And I think it's so important to realize that your healthy midlife is the best predictor of your health in old age and for the rest of your life. So this is when we really want to start paying attention to our health and prioritizing health. And self-care is not selfish. Menopause care is not selfish. It's an investment. So I really would love all women to just realize that your body loves you. And if you just love yourself back, you're just going to have such a much easier transition, right? And so also it's really important to, to appreciate the solutions are available, right? There's many things that one can do to feel better during the transition of menopause and after, after menopause. And it's really a matter of committing to a plan, finding out what, what the right solutions are for you, committing to to taking care of yourself, making time for yourself. It takes discipline, but the benefits are for life. Yes. Oh my gosh. So wise. So well said. So much and also, also, you know, one more thing. Yeah. We go through puberty. Everybody celebrates. We get yeah. pregnant. We have kids. There's parties. There's baby showers. There's pictures. Everybody. Where's my so menopause proud. party? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I want to party. I was telling my husband, when I go through menopause, I want to party. There's there's no sense of achievement when it comes to menopause. Women don't talk about it. They, no, but you know, this is one of this this is one of the the true gifts of your book, I think, Lisa, is that you're you're very much part of a movement right now and giving women the vehicle and the language for conversation to be open about this so that we can if we're not celebrating it, we're at least open with being able to not feel ashamed of what's going on with us, to not feel so confused or embarrassed um, that we can talk about it openly with each other and help edu educate each other. Um, and so your book just, it feels so empowering because there is a sense, I think prior to the now, the moment that is now, I think there was a lot of shame wrapped in going through menopause, right? Like That's we don't fine. speak it. We don't talk like my mother never talked about this. I'm sure her mother never did. It just wasn't yeah. talked about. And so I think secrecy always breeds shame. And yeah. and so, wow, great. I have to go through all of these confusing symptoms and feel sh ashamed on top of it. Like, no. So you are taking care of that stigma, destigmatizing menopause and making it something that we can laugh about talk about love each other through support each other through here's what i know this helps try this um and in, in real information because there are folks out there espousing things that are not medically or evidence-based and so everyone you can trust lisa Moscone, like this is the, this is the real deal you are this is all incredibly well researched and just so beautifully told your book is beautiful i'm so proud of you thank you